So thank you very much, uh, Zlatko. I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, if not, please uh, voice out and uh, I hope everyone can see my mouth as well. And so thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, seminar. I'm very happy to be speaking here. I hope everyone is keeping safe and well in these times, uh, very unprecedented. So as this seminar is about non-equilibrium, today I'll be talking about indeed non-equilibrium non phases of matter protected by multiple time transition symmetries in quasi periodically driven systems. It's quite a mouthful, but I'll explain to you exactly in what sense these uh, interacting phases of matter are novel and non-equilibrium, and in what sense are they protected in the usual sense, like in equi equilibrium physics, uh, how symmetries play a role in defining them. So this is work done in collaboration with Dominic Els uh, at, at MIT and Philip Dimitrescu at CCQ and Flat Iron New York. Um, so without further ado, uh, this is essentially the overview of what I'll be talking about, that there can be non novel non-equilibrium phases of matter, for example, discrete time quasi-crystals, which are generalizations of like discrete time crystals, and new topological phases uh, that arise when you drive a system uh, in a certain structure in time, which is quasi periodic drivings, uh, and also how these phases are protected in some e um, effective preheating or pre thermalization uh, description. So, just as a motivation, you know, in the field of condensed matter, uh, we're interested in studying phases of matter, like how different, build different microscopic building blocks uh, as a collective, what new phases emerge from them, like what are the universal phases. And for example, um, you could have say some abstract parameter space, you know, if, as you tune parameter one, there's some solid, uh, some, some regular pattern of atoms, and as you tune some other parameter two, which could be temperature, for example, then the solid could melt and become a liquid. And maybe there's another phase transition, uh, a different uh, variable starts to order and you get a ferromagnet. And what really unifies, or what forms a unifying framework to understand these phases is the concept of symmetries. Uh, we use the concept of, uh, so especially, um, in, the, in the context of spontaneous breaking of the symmetries. And, and this is called Landau paradigm. Um, so for example, in a pattern of uh, regular atoms, which is a solid, you have this, uh, you know, the atoms are locked in a regular pattern. And so the, the original, uh, you know, transition symmetry, which is continuous, has been broken down into this, this very discrete pattern. Whereas in a liquid, you, you, you still have, you still retain this continuous time, uh, spatial translation symmetry. And so that's how you can distinguish between phases in the Landau paradigm. And recently, we know that if you add topology to the game, you can get extra phases, you can get new exotic phases that are you know, um, protected by long range entanglement, uh, for example, symmetry protected topological phases, symmetry enriched topological phases, and so on and so forth. So in this talk, I want to ask the question, um, is there you know, a notion of phases of matter out of equilibrium? Because in this phase diagram that I've drawn, I've drawn is it's usually uh, talked about when the phases are at equilibrium, when the system has settled down, for example, to a thermal state, or if you're talking about topological order, that's usually in the ground state when there's a gap between the ground state and the first excited state. And so those are usually equilibrium properties of a system. Now I want to ask, is there something also happening in dynamics and how can we sharply define the notion of phases of matter which are out of equilibrium? And more uh, precisely, how can we characterize them? How can we define them? What are the roles of symmetries uh, that give rise to these new phases, especially of dynamics? So the basic question um, that I want, or the basic setup that I want to focus on is that of isolated quantum many body systems undergoing unitary time evolution. So I want to imagine that I have a system of spins or, or atoms, and it's a very large system. And I want to consider systems in which I'm externally driving it. So um, the system is, is uh, exchanging possibly, uh, there's no energy conservation with the, with the uh, I mean, it doesn't have energy conservation, but I do not want to couple the system to a bar. So I want to think of this system as being in isolation and therefore dynamics, dynamics is still unitary and is governed by this unitary time evolution operator. And so the basic question that uh, one could ask is beginning from some initial state, uh, time evolve it, and of course, it's going to go as some, in, in some coherent evolution. But if I look locally, you know, in some small region of the, of the spatial extent of the space, and, and if I look at the, at the local density matrix, 
uh, as I evolve in time, what kind of steady states does it reach? You know, does it thermalize or does it you know, reach a steady state which might even be dynamical in nature, uh, extending the notion of what a steady state would be? And now this question seems a bit academic or it seems a bit idealized because which system in the world is isolated from completely from the environment and above. But it turns out that there are many um, emerging platforms or even emergent uh, platforms that have emerged uh, experimentally, which allow us to probe systems in such settings. Uh, these are especially uh, common in uh, systems of AMO uh, type systems like trap ions, cold atoms, superconducting qubits, or even like solid state defects such as nitrogen vacancy centers in diamond, where uh, you can have ensemble, ensembles of spins or atoms and they are very well isolated from the environment. So you can treat the evolution as just coherent and unitary. And furthermore, experimentalists have done a really good job in scaling up the system sizes. So then we can in fact now uh, approach the realm of many body physics and define many body phases of matter here. So th this is not just simply an idealized question, but it actually has many uh, interesting questions that can be probed experimentally. So um, the first question, uh, the, 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 the intuition that we can have, uh, if the system is interacting, and, and to answer the basic question that I pose as to like what happens to the steady state of a, of a local subregion of a system, is that you know, interacting systems, uh, many body interacting systems, we believe that many of them are typically agotic. That means to say that um, energy can spread equally well throughout the environment because of the interactions or particles can be exchanged uh, equally well. So, and if that happens, then if you look locally at a subregion, over time, you can imagine that even if you begin with some spins which are polarized in some direction, due to the exchange of energy from the inside of this region A to the outside, over time, the system will settle down eventually, have its energy equally distributed across the system, and it will settle down to your usual notion of what is known as a thermal state or a Gibbs state, where um, the temperature of the state is set by the global energy, and maybe there are some constraints set by global conservation, such as particle number or or extra U1 conserved charges, for example. And, and this scenario is, is what is known as the uh, usual coupling to the heat bath scenario, because even though from the outset, I assumed that the, that the entire system was well isolated and not coupled to the bath, nevertheless, if I look locally, the system appears as though it's coupled to a, as a bath. So it's, uh, you can say that the, the system itself is serving as its own heat bath. And therefore this reduces to the conventional scenario and this is, of course, an interesting question as to how it happens, uh, which goes under the guise of the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. But from the point of view of new phases of matter, this is maybe not so interesting because this is saying that you would, you would get pretty much what you would have gotten if you had a time independent Hamiltonian. So we need ways out of this uh, agolic scenario. And so in recent years, we've, we have understood that if you add strong disorder to the system, if you add pinning fields which are heavily disordered in space, you, you might end up in this regime uh, which, in which you have many body localization uh, and that where the spins or the, the degrees of freedom, they uh, remember the initial conditions for an infinite time. And so the basic question that we, I asked in the previous slide, uh, what happens to a few groups of spins locally is that they retain their information and therefore they don't thermalize to this uh, usual scenario. And this would be one answer to the question as to what other outcomes are there, what other steady states are there besides the usual conventional uh, wisdom that we, 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 we have. And so th this would indeed classify as a non-thermalizing dynamical phase of matter. Of course, there are other um, exceptions, for example, systems which are integrable, systems which uh, have extensive conserved quantities relating to the very precise mathematical structure of, of, the, of the model in question. But usually these systems are pretty much fine-tuned, meaning to say that if I perturb away from this, uh, this idealized limit, then you would flow into the ergodic system, of course, at some rate, but nevertheless, you end up uh, back into the usual thermal scenario. So in this talk, I'll stay away from the notion of integrability, and I wanna talk about generic phases that can emerge. But in these two cases I've described, um, the, the steady state that's reached is nevertheless static. So it's not actually moving in time. And I want something a bit more exotic. Can I actually have a steady state, which um, extending the notion of what steady state means, can I have a steady state be also dynamical in nature, have a certain envelope in time as, as, I, as, I, as I observe it over time? And um, one 
one class of systems that maybe can afford uh, or accord such a scenario is the class of periodically driven or floquet systems. So what, what are these systems? These systems are simply those in which the Hamiltonian is periodically varying in time. So you know, um, it repeats in time of the period big T. And uh, you, you might notice that this seems like a symmetry because uh, I'm relating two arguments of the Hamiltonian and one in time t and one in time t plus after one period. And indeed, we can call this a discrete time translation symmetry. But this is rather different from the usual uh, onset symmetry that we, we are used to in, in, in um, you know, defining equilibrium phases. Because there, we, uh, what, what it means is that we have a symmetry that commutes with the Hamiltonian and it partitions the Hilbert space. But in this, in this case, it's more the, the, the fact that the generator of time uh, just simply is periodic. And so it, it's not entirely clear how it acts in the same way as an onset symmetry. But nevertheless, um, I, I want to argue in this talk that such a structure, that the fact that the two arguments are related in time, uh, do have observable consequences and can be used to sharply define new phases of, of matter, as you will see. And I will also generalize this to the quasi-periodic system. So how does this manifest itself, the periodicity in time? of the generator of time translation. So we know, uh, so th there's this theorem called Fouquet's theorem, which says that if you have this periodicity in time, the time evolution operator, the, the unitary time evolution operator can be decomposed into two parts. One part is a unitary, which is time uh, periodic as well, with the same periodicity as the Hamiltonian, and one part which is time independent. So H of F is something called the Fouquet Hamiltonian, and uh, you can, you can you can obtain it by, by evolving over one period and taking a logarithm of the unitary. But, uh, so naively, one would say, uh, and, and I, I should mention that this is basically the time uh, version of Bloch's theorem. So at stroboscopic times, you would naively say that dynamics is simply generated by a time in independent Hamiltonian, H of F. And this seems to suggest that this reduces to the usual static Hamiltonian scenario. So, um, so maybe there are two outcomes, one is thermalizing, one is MBL, but aside from that, nothing more happens from this. But what I want to argue is that while this is true as a theorem, as a mathematical theorem or, or, or mathematical statement, I, I want to say that this, is, this way of viewing a Fouquet system and using Fouquet's theorem can actually be a crutch in many body systems, because this crucially misses out, misses out the fact that H of F could be highly non-local and, and is typically non-local if you define it in such a fashion. So while it might be possible to always define a, uh, the, the Fouquet Hamiltonian by taking the logarithm of U of F, you have to take a branch cut and you, you, there's no, typically no way, I, I wouldn't say that the proof for this, but we expect that there's no way to express H of F uh, as, a non, as a local Hamiltonian. Uh, and this is important because we want to, we, we need a notion of spatial locality to define long range ordering, because if H of F simply looks like a random matrix, then it has no structure in space, and, 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 and therefore it's not very useful in defining uh, phases of matter which uh, are, are many body in nature. And furthermore, while this decomposition in terms of, you know, time periodic unitary, the envelope, and some uh, factor, uh, some evolution which is time independent, it misses out the fact that there can be other non-trivial decompositions of the dynamics in which the, okay, so I'm gonna call this a micro motion, in which the micro motion might not be time periodic. And um, th this is crucially also tied to the, to the first point, which is that while there's always a change of frame in which you know, the dynamics is always periodic and uh, given by time independent, this guy is non-local. So the question arises, perhaps there's a different way of viewing the system in which there is a local Hamiltonian evolution, but the micro motion might not be time periodic with big T. So let me just illustrate this with a very simple scenario, uh, a two level system. So I, I know I'm talking about many body systems, but you can even just understand what I'm talking about by the non-trivial decomposition, decompositions in a two level system. So imagine that you have two level system given by you know, some um, splitting, some, some some detuning between two levels of an atom and then you're driving it uh, in some polarized manner. So the matrix is just this. And look, staring at this, you can immediately say that this is exactly solvable if you go into this frame of reference. So if you're rotating at with one level, rotating at some speed, then you can define H of F 
uh, the Fourier Hamiltonian, and you can see that this is indeed time independent, and therefore this is the solution to the um, you know the, the time evolution evolution equation uh, that is envelope, which is time periodic. But consider instead if we decide to first go into the frame of reference of the first guy, you know, the detuning piece, and you, you know, you will notice that this object Q of t is actually two t periodic. So it takes two uh, floquet periods to come back to itself, and, uh, and and this is related to the fact that you know uh, the amplitude here I've chosen it to be omega over two. So when the time t is uh, you know one period, then this induces a pi, like, like this factor is pi. So this is just a pi, uh, is, is pi spin flip in the x basis because as the effects the spin flip in the x basis. And now if you go into the frame of reference of Q of t, you will derive an interaction Hamiltonian, which is now time periodic as well, but with a different period. So this is also 2t periodic. And what you notice is that if we assume that the frequency of driving omega is larger than the um, amplitude, then you can solve for a, an effective Hamiltonian description. And you'll find that to leading order, you know, uh, because th these terms are oscillating, so th they would vanish, but the Fouquet Hamiltonian would be basically of lambda square order. And there's an envelope which is uh, also of lambda over omega order, but it will be 2t periodic. So the upshot is that you can take this system and you can solve it in two different ways. You can solve it in the Fouquet way, where you can say this is t periodic. And you can, but in this other way, you can see that um, you can also pull out this you know, envelope, which is 2t periodic, and they find a different kind of time independent evolution. And um, specifically at stroboscopic times, uh, when, when, when t is the big period, you'll find that it's decomposed into two parts. One part is a unitary that I'm going to call it x, which is you know, q and p prime evaluated at big t. And one part is the time evolution by local Hamiltonian. So, uh, so in, in this case, there's no locality because it's a two-level system, but, but one part by a time independent Hamiltonian. So the, the only point I want to make here is that, you know, just because there is Fouquet's theorem doesn't mean that there are other decompositions which might not exist. And in fact, some might be more useful than others because especially in the case for many body systems. So the crucial point is that, uh, as I mentioned in the last slide, H of F here is typically non-local. But if in this case, you, if you can find a frame in which um, there's an effective Hamiltonian description, which is local, and um, the macro motion is not trivially related, uh, does not have trivially the time periodicity of my driving Hamiltonian, then it might be possible to define normal phases of matter because um, especially when the system responds along with this uh, macro motion in a non-trivial fashion, uh, in, in, a, in a beyond the uh, time periodicity fashion of the original drive. So, and, and indeed, indeed, this is exactly how uh, new phases uh, in many body systems can be defined. Floquet SPTs uh, can be cast in this form, you know, chiral Floquet phases uh, and discrete, even a discrete time crystal, which uh, most people would understand, know and understand also can be cast in this form. So um, yeah, any questions at this stage? Yeah, okay, if not, then I will, I have yeah. Let me ask this at the end, okay? So I don't. I don't okay, sure. No, let me ask you. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, so we, we see that uh, Floquet systems or periodically driven systems, uh, you, may, you know, has have a lot of structure to them, and and our aim really is to understand uh, in what cases can I see the system in a more useful manner than in the one accorded by the Floquet's theorem. Like I want something in which the time evolution is is local, and then the macro motion might be non-trivially related to the original periodicity. Before I do that, I, I want to contend with the many body nature uh, of the system, because if I drive it, then there's an obstacle to achieving even new phases uh, at late times, that, which is the problem of heating. Because you know, I'm, I have no more energy conservation in the system. I'm driving the system with some um, field which is, has some photonic energy, a quantum of energy, omega. And the system in general can heat up by absorbing or emitting, emitting such a photon of energy. Now, because of energy a lack of energy, energy conservation, if the system is ergodic, we expect that the, locally the system should just equally distribute all its energy uh, and it will end up in a featureless infinite temperature state, meaning to say that every microstate is equally likely. 
meaning to say that observables are basically just vanishing or there's no feature in them. So we cannot even define anything uh, interesting in, in such a scenario. So it seems to me to us that you know having structure in, in time of the driving is is helpful to to maybe tease out uh, tease out new phases, but at the same time we also have to contend with this like deleterious effect of heating that the systems possess. So how to avoid heating at least for a long time scale, if not infinite, uh, or the other way around, uh, infinite if not for a very long time scale. So it turns out that in Floquet systems you can also induce the notion of many body localization. Uh, through strong disorder and in which initial conditions are remembered for a long time. So the system does not end up in this featureless infinite temperature uh, state. And this is another version, which is uh, another uh, a possibility, which is that if you drive the system at very high frequencies, then you might end up um, in this scenario called high frequency driving, in which the system basically takes, it's very hard for the system to heat up uh, due to on shell processes because the energy uh, mismatch is very large compared to the local spacing, uh, local bandwidth of the system. So to, to flesh out this point a bit more, so, so the, these were um, you know, covered in works, uh, including myself, uh, so where, where we talked about how long a time scale such high frequency driven systems can uh, not achieve the featureless infinite temperature state, how, how long the system is stable with respect to driving for. So the, the main idea is that if you are driving a system which is local and has a local bandwidth, meaning to say that uh, locally it takes maybe J uh, energy to flip a spin or to do some local re rearrangement of the system, uh, and, and that's small compared to the frequency at which you're driving it, then it turns out that the rate at which the system heats up is actually exponentially suppressed in the driving frequency over the local bandwidth. And one can understand this in a very simplified and heuristic manner, but can be cast in rigorous arguments um, in that let's consider just one eigenstate of the system and let's consider transitions affected by the drive where I'm transitioning due to one quantum of energy absorbed or, or emitted. So in order to do a, a, this transition, the system has to do many, many local rearrangements of the, of the state in question uh, because you know, each local rearrangement is only J and so you need to hit a resonance and you need to undergo many, for example, spin flips. But this is a very high order process. And, and in perturbation theory, you can say that this high order process is suppressed because of the number of like moves you need to, to make. And it turns out that you can rigorously bound this uh, as an exponential. So in this system, heating is slow. So you can promote this to the statement that, and in this uh, following works rigorous theorems, that um, it's not just heating from one eigenstate, which is slow, but the system actually has a approximate conserved quantity, which is uh, in, an effective static quasi-local Hamiltonian, H effective, <clears throat> uh, which also governs, <clears throat> sorry, which also governs the time evolution for a long time. And by long time, I mean exponentially long in the driving frequency time. And to construct this H effective, this is also related to uh, what you know, people usually think of uh, as a Magnus expansion, you know, uh, one over T, VT, and so on. Uh, other commutators, higher order commutators of the dri driving Hamiltonian and, and, and so on. So um, basically this, this is just saying that the system, uh, even when it's being driven at high frequencies, does not heat up, but looks as though it's being driven by, uh, by a effective static local Hamiltonian. So, for the, uh, so that solves the, the obstacle of heating, uh, uh, the, the, the bad effects of it. But that doesn't seem to square with our previous requirement of looking for new phases of matter in a uh, driven system because previously I mentioned that we would like for the Floquet unitary or the time evolution operator not to be uh, easily expressible in terms of just simply a time independent Hamiltonian evolution which is local because if I only had a local Hamiltonian evolution then I'll end up in the usual conventional scenarios. So I wanted a, 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 you know, a drive in which the um, Floquet unitary uh, or the Floquet, the time evolution operator necessarily is decomposed into two parts uh, where it's impossible to put them together in, into the same exponential and recast it as evolution by, by a local Hamiltonian. So the, the reconciliation of what I mentioned before that we can find scenarios in which you have effective quasi-local Hamiltonian evolution and the desire to have this 
uh, very uh, non hamiltonian evolution form is the fact that in the previous slide, when I took the high frequency limit, I took it in a lab frame where I just assumed that the driving frequency was the fastest, highest compared to every local coupling. So the, re the reconciliation is that you need, need not take the high frequency limit in the lab frame. So there might be some classes of drives where some, or one should go into some appropriate rotating frame first, and then one can cast the uh, unitary time evolution operator in this form while still um, hinging or, or, or utilizing the fact that in this rotating frame there is slow heating because of this approximate energy conservation. And here's a very quick example, and this will be illustrative, and uh, I'll go through this slowly uh, to explain this. So imagine uh, a bunch of spins, you know, spin one halves, and I'm applying a Rabi field to it. So um, S of X basically just flips the spin from up to down, but with a very, very strong amplitude, which I'm going to take to be half that of the driving frequency. And this part here, H of zero, is basically time periodic uh, and, and, and has a period of T. Uh, it, it contains interactions and, and what have you. But the point is that I can go into this rotating frame associated with the Rabi frequency. And you notice that um, this frame change is 2T periodic. Now, upon going into this frame change, you can define the interaction of the Hamiltonian, which is basically the conjugation of the interaction, uh, the, the H0 piece with the frame change. And you notice that this Hamiltonian is now 2T periodic. But what you, you, you gain from this is that originally, it was impossible to take the high frequency limit because of the fact that the amplitude was also very large compared to the frequency. So it, it's not a justified expansion uh, or, or the, the results of slow heating don't apply there because you know, the frequency omega is, is comparable to the amplitude at which you're driving it. But in this new frame, it turns out that the only amplitude that's remaining is that of H0 and all the frequencies are basically omega over two. So that this is a bona fide high frequency scenario where if, if, if omega is larger than any local couplings of H0, you can take the high frequency limit and therefore you can get an effective Hamiltonian. But that, that basically solves both questions. Like you can have a scenario in which the system doesn't heat up in, uh, quickly, uh, has approximate energy conservation, and you need to pull out this micro motion, this rotating frame in front of it, which will give rise to this extra factor here. And, and this is the setting in which one can uh, possibly realize new phases. Um, okay, so that was a basic example, but it turns out that um, it's not just a, the statement about a rotating frame transformation because the, that seems very technical, but um, the key point I want to make is that actually um, the system um, has very special structure due to the time periodicity of the drive. So there is a way in which uh, the system has extra structure if you only input in the fact that the system is, is being uh, driven at period T. And so these gentlemen, Dominic Els, uh, Bella Bauer and Chetan Nayak, um, say they considered, they, they, they gave a class of systems in which they uh, found that the discrete time transition symmetry of a Floquet system, which is the periodicity of the Hamiltonian, actually guarantees that the effective Hamiltonian the preheating Hamiltonian in a, in a appropriate rotating frame has certain emergent symmetries. So this slide is a bit technical, but, but let me just run you through it. And it, it's pretty much the same statement as, uh, same setup as was before, but I've slightly generalized this, where now consider a class of systems in which I have two pieces. You know, one piece is a part which is being driven by a sum of local terms, for example, the Rabi uh, drives, and its amplitude is very large, uh, omega over n, and, and large I mean it's comparable to the frequency because this is just a factor of the frequen frequency, and it's some integer not related to the system size, which is like two or three or four, and v contains all the interactions. So in a very similar spirit, it, um, you cannot take the high frequency limit in this lab frame because of this large amplitude, but you can play the same game of going to the rotating frame where you can define this unitary uh, micro motion frame uh, which is rotating at this speed. And you notice that this is periodic, but with a larger period than the original base frequency or the original base period that the system has. And it turns out that in this case, if, if gamma has integer eigenvalues, 
then if you define uh, this, this object, which is x, which is the uh, macro motion evaluated at one period, you need to wait for n period before you can get back to itself. So it has a larger periodicity, uh, is actually uh, n times uh, periodic of the original system. And then the interaction Hamiltonian, once again, uh, you can now take the, the, the standard higher frequency limit because all couplings are local and, and small compared to, to the frequency at which uh, this interaction Hamiltonian is, is rotating with. But the crucial point that they observe or they, they, they made of, of, uh, is that um, it, it's not just a statement about energy conservation. It's the fact that there is a way of constructing the effective Hamiltonian such that the effective Hamiltonian has now an emergent symmetry, uh, meaning to say that it commutes with this, this generator x, because as you can see, x, um, if you raise it to the power n is one, so that's the generator of the zn symmetry. And so h effective now retains, or not, not retains, but has a symmetry uh, pertaining to x. So here v is simply a small change uh, of frame from the lab frame. So you can think of it as a small rotation in the way you, you start to view the, the spins or the, the atoms. Uh, for most purposes, you can just ignore it. Uh, so the crucial point is that effective Hamiltonian has the symmetry. And, and let me stress again that this does not require at all that the original driving Hamiltonian had any symmetry to begin with. It doesn't require h of t to commute with x. So this guy could be literally anything uh, as long as it's local and, and has this kind of structure. But if you're driving in this particular class, then it always turns out that you can always uh, define this effective Hamiltonian in which it is a symmetry. And this is really the manifestation of the discrete time transition symmetry of the Floquet system. Um, and let me also add one more point, which is that this seems a bit fine-tuned in the sense that I needed to uh, I consider a very particular amplitude, omega over n. But the point is that this, this construction is not at all fine-tuned because if I deviate from, say, this perfect amplitude, omega over n, a small bit, I can simply just reabsorb it into what I mean by v. And of course, that would simply change my slight change of frame, you know, my, my small change of frame. That would slightly de redefine my effective Hamiltonian. But the statement that that effective Ham Hamiltonian has a, a, a zn symmetry, which is emergent, still remains. And so this is really a very robust and very uh, stable property. Any questions at this stage? I have one now. Um, so you say that if, if I deviate from the sort of omega over n sort of fine-tuned amplitude, you can absorb it into V. So I, that, that's certainly true. So I guess then my question is, is there any simple way to explain what the limit, so if I take your Hamiltonian here, the specific Hamiltonian you have here, mm -hmm. with, with a given V, is there an easy way of telling, you know, just looking at the Hamiltonian of telling whether I can actually get some robust phase like this, like a DTC or some, some, of, some of that type of thing that's robust, or, or do I need to look at it in detail case by case? Because I understand that you're, what you're showing here is that your formalism, you know, works, so all this kind of thing works. Yeah. Uh, and then the question is, do, do you know if there's any yeah, um, so, so it's, it's, right, it's a good question. So uh, what I'm saying here is that the emergent symmetry is always present, uh, assuming the conditions are met. But as to the question of whether you will get new phases is, would depend on strongly on the type of interactions in this V. No, like, um, and I'll, I'll explain this in the next slide. So maybe that will be clearer. So, so the upshot is that, yeah, I think you would have to look at it in a case by case basis uh, to understand whether or not the effective Hamiltonian hosts um, new phases or not. Uh, th but the statement that H effective is always symmetric is, is, is present. Can I ask something? So is yeah. it correct then to, to, to say that what you're saying is that if omega over n gamma plus V omega T has a phase, then if I go and change a bit the amplitude of gamma, it won't go away. Is that correct? Uh, if the effective Hamiltonian has a phase. So you, you need to construct if, this. Yeah, that's right. If, 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 yeah, if, if it has a phase, then, and then you, if you perturb it slightly, you'll get H effective plus some small perturbation, and then you will still remain in the same phase. Thanks. Yeah. So maybe I can illustrate this uh, in the next example, or I'll first illustrate why you can get new phases from this formalism. It seems a bit techni technical. So um, just ignore this small change of frames for now. And so I, I copy and paste once again the theorem. Uh, 
so you know, I'm saying that the time evolution operator has two parts to it, effectively, time uh, independent evolution and some large unitary, some, some large micro motion, which is not smoothly connected to the identity. Uh, so meaning to say that this two cannot be expressed very simply as a local Hamiltonian evolution. So for now, let's just ignore the fact that you have this small change of frame and ignore the fact that you have this X. So H effective is, as, as I said, something that has ZN symmetry. For now, let's just take it to be a Z2 symmetry, usual icing case. And so we know that you know, if the spectrum of H effective um, is icing symmetric, there's a chance, not guaranteed, so it's case by case, that it might spontaneously break the symmetry. Uh, for example, in a transverse field icing, in 1D, the ground state breaks it spontaneously. Uh, but you know, for higher dimensions, you know, 2D short range icing, then there's, there's a finite temperature spectrum that spontaneously breaks the symmetry, which means to say that the, the eigenstates come in long range or the cat states, you know, S here is some spin uh, configuration, S bar is the opposite spin configuration related by the spin flip operator. And then you sum them up and they have long range entanglement, for example, for this icing scenario. So imagine now that we ignore X and we just have evolution under H effective. And I begin with some initial state, which is predominantly in one of the valleys, one of the symmetry broken wells uh, of the system. Then we know that as, as I let the system evolve in time, it will basically um, you know, explore this phase phase around a well, but it's very hard for it to, well, it's, it's, it's almost impo impossible for it to escape this well and, and end up in the other symmetry broken valley because um, there's a huge tunneling barrier. So um, one can ask, uh, how long does it take to tunnel between here and here? So in a case when H effective is simply you know, time independent, then this is set by the splitting or the energy splitting between the two different wells. And that's usually exponentially small in system size. So you have to wait exponentially long in system size for you to tunnel out of this. In this scenario, when we um, derive this um, evolution from a driven system, so you have to also worry about heating. And so heating just says that uh, there's some exponentially long time in frequency, not in system size. So this picture will also break if, uh, if you wait exponentially long in frequency. So basically the, the, the lifetime of this picture where it, it explores only this well, this um, uh, symmetry constrained thermalization is related to the shorter time scale. So in this case, the, the, the smallness in the driving uh, the heating rate. And, and so you see that if I measure an order parameter like SZ, and if I begin with a state that lives here, I would see that basically there might be some fluctuations, but in the idealized limit, it stays just one because I only measure this order parameter one. But now consider the case, uh, consider the actual scenario when we actually have to put in the action of the spin flip symmetry X uh, after every period T. So what it does is that after one period T, the system you know, may, might thermalize here slightly or explore this phase space here, but then the spin flip just flips it over to the other valley, and then it starts to explore here as well, and then so on and so forth. So the, the funny thing is then, if I measure the order parameter, I would see you know, that it is I, I'm basically measuring whether you're in this valley one first for some time and the valley two, but you notice that it only comes back to itself after two driving periods one driving period to be in one valley, another driving period, and then another driving period before it can come back to this valley. So this response of the order parameter is quite different from the original periodicity of the driving Hamiltonian, which we assumed was with period T only, you know, frequency omega. Here the frequency is omega over two. And, and this is robust because uh, the only way it breaks is that the system heats up and then loses the structure. So this behavior has an envelope which lasts for an exponentially, exponentially long time in frequency. And, and so, um, and yeah, so going back to the question asked about whether or not um, this depends on the nature of the Hamiltonian in question. Yep, so it does because here I've explicitly assumed that we have this symmetry broken value kind of like picture. That means that H effective has some spontaneously breaking uh, part of the spectrum. Uh, you could have, for example, a, a, a Hamiltonian that doesn't spontaneously break the symmetry, like a paramagnet. So then there would not be such a scenario. And then in this case, even though you can always still write the time evolution in this manner, you will not see a robust long-lived uh, oscillation, which is 2T periodic. Uh, 
So, th so th this two periodic signals the is something called a subharmonic response, uh, as is well known in time crystal literature. So, um, the basic statement is that we're inputting into the frequency uh, into the Hamiltonian uh, system. Uh, with dri we're driving it with frequencies which are integer times of omega, and at late times the system responds quite differently. It doesn't respond in sync with the Hamiltonian, but it responds at an integer uh, factor uh, of the uh, of the driving frequency, so omega n over n z, and and so this indeed is a an example of a of a non equilibrium phase of matter, which is not possible in a non-driven system. It, it explicitly requires a Fourier drive, and this is what is known as a discrete time crystal. And this change from the um, period the periodicity from t to, to nt is what is known as a spontaneous breaking of discrete time transition symmetry uh, as, as uh, put forth by uh, pioneering works in 2016. So in the remainder of the talk, I will uh, explain how this concept can be further generalized and uh, is to the quasi-periodic scenario. Uh, so at this, case, uh, in this, at this stage, any questions so far? So yeah. So what is uh, a quasi-periodically driven system? So it's, it's really, um, you can think of it as a general, generalization of a Fourier system in which instead of just one fundamental frequency, you're driving the system with multiple frequencies, omega one to omega m, uh, and Hamiltonian is comprised of a Fourier series of all these different modes uh, where omega dot n is the, the base frequency n is, some, is just some integer vectors. And we have this condition that the driving frequencies are rationally independent, meaning to say that they do not sum up to one, uh, sorry, they do not sum up to zero uh, for any choice of integer vector n unless n is zero. Um, and th th this is a bit technical, but in a case for two, two, two drives, you can just simply say that you just want the ratios to be incommensurate. So uh, that, that's all that is. And so here's an example of a quasi-periodic function or drive, in this case, you know, just a one dimensional Hamiltonian. Um, and you can see that this has some pattern, but it's, it clearly doesn't repeat in time. Uh, there's no t period at all. So naively, one would say that, that, that there's less structure in dynamics than a Fouquet drive. And why should one even consider it? But it turns out that, that the way to understand quasi periodically driven systems is in the higher, um, in, in a space which is extended and um, and you can understand a driven system as being derived from this extended space picture. So instead of having a, a Hamiltonian that is only a function of a single time, one should really think of it as a, a Hamiltonian that lives on some torus of angles, and we are simply evaluating a Hamiltonian along some trajectory around the, around the torus at some rate which is given by omega t, and that gives, gives rise to this Hamiltonian in one physical time um, domain. So yeah, it, it inherits this property. And in this way of looking at it, you can clearly see that the extended space Hamiltonian has in fact many symmetries because it is periodic uh, in terms of translations by two pi in this direction and two pi in this direction and, and so on for higher, higher dimensional tori. And so we can interpret this as the notion of multiple time translation symmetries. And in fact, I will argue that this gives rise to the bigger class of uh, phase structure that quasi periodically driven systems have over Fouquet systems. And this is what enables us to realize new phases which are beyond even Fouquet systems. Um, I, I should mention that, that this is one very nice way of basically, you can think of it as having extra dimensions in the system. Um, of course, you, you could, you're, as a theorist, one is free to always define a universe with like two or three extra time dimensions, but by using a quasi-periodically driven uh, Hamiltonian, you can actually realize the notion of higher extended spaces by only utilizing one physical time uh, direction that we have in a lab, and therefore this, these phases are realizable. So some challenges that one face, of course, in quasi-periodically driven systems, just like in Fouquet systems, is that is there an analogous slow heating regime? And how then, how can we analyze quasi Fourier driven systems, the formalism, because we cannot simply look at a single time Fouquet operator, U of F in, this, in the case of Fouquet systems. And more importantly, what new phases can emerge under such settings? 
So um, of course, the answer to the first question will be yes, otherwise I'll not be giving this talk right now. Um, but first, let me just explain to you why this is not such a non-trivial question. Uh, sorry, why this is not such a, such a trivial question. <clears throat> because in this case, the energy absorption of the, uh, in, a, in a driven system uh, happens in intervals given by omega dot n, where, which sets the driving frequency of the field. And this forms a dense spectrum because you can take arbitrarily many uh, linear combinations or high enough combinations and you can always find a value which is very close to zero. So in the case of Fouquet, you, one was protected at high frequencies because of a, um, what I would call a gapped photon spectrum where it takes many spin flips to, to transition and absorb in, in uh, on shell fashion this, this, this photon of energy. But it seems to us that in the quasi-periodic case that you could absorb arbitrarily uh, small energies and therefore resonances are always possible. So heating should always be fast and you will not see any stability in time at all. But this reasoning is a bit quick and uh, naive because while this energy quanta um, difference is dense, it is very structured. How small it is as a function of like the, uh, the size of the inter integer vector that you can take is very well controlled and is given by uh, something called a Diophantin condition that almost all choices of frequency vectors uh, obey. So the, the rate at which this resonance, uh, this energy splitting goes to zero is basically a power law in number of frequencies, and the number of independent frequencies that you can have. So, um, and, and that, is, that is basically what will save the day and that would, is what allows us to identify a regime in which heating is not so quick. So if we also assume that the transition elements, the, 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 which are set by the Fourier modes of the drive, decay fast enough in frequency, which translates to the statement that the drives are smooth in time, then we can rigorously derive that the heating rate um, is uh, less than the, the amplitude squared uh, times the suppression factor due to some locality due to the density, uh, due to the energy splitting. And optimizing the, uh, the, the vector n, which gives rise to the fastest heating rate, shows that <clears throat> the heating rate is bounded from below, or heating time is bounded from below by a stretch exponential. So it's basically uh, stretch, stretch exponential in one over the number of driving frequencies. Here's m. And epsilon is just some arbitrarily small number. So it's the, the statement is that you have an, an analogous slow heating statement where the system doesn't quite heat up for a long time, maybe not as long as the Fouquet system, but long enough that we can you know, be comfortable in saying that you might be able to achieve uh, interesting phase structure and dynamics, uh, which is not simply just a washed out version, a featureless infinite temperature version of the, of the dynamics. Okay. And so when you know, we promoted this to a rigorous theorem in our work, uh, so I would just simply very sketch it really quickly. If you assume that there's a many-body Hamiltonian that is local in nature, you know, um, is smooth in time, so that the frequency components decay fast enough in, in Fourier space, driven at high frequencies, and we assume that the driving frequency vectors obeys the Diophantin equation, then we can similarly derive that there is an effective Hamiltonian description D, D is some quasi-local Hamiltonian, that, that governs dynamics for a long time, and also gives rise to approximate energy, energy conservation. Uh, of course, we have to dress it with some uh, micro motion, which in this case will be small, but quasi local and, and time quasi periodic. And, and this description lasts for a stretch exponentially long time. So if I look at a local observable, like I, some O, then you notice that <clears throat> initially there's some transients and it will basically settle down to a thermal state given by the effective Hamiltonian D set by the temperature of, of, of the energy conservation of D. But on top of that, in the lab frame, there'll be some extra micro motion due to this envelope here. <clears throat> One might naively think that this is simply the generalization of the Floquet theorem for a quasi periodic system. And the statement of equality here will be exact. But let me caution that this is not guaranteed at all. And there are cases where we know that there are obstructions to this, to this equality sign where uh, yeah, you cannot define a Fouquet Hamiltonian or Fouquet decomposition in this manner. So this statement is actually quite non-trivial and we were showing that in this scenario that is an approximate version of it. But, but this is precisely what will allow us to define new phases of matter in an analogous fashion as what I've shown before in the 
uh, 4K, 4K case. So now this slide is a, is a bit techni technical, but I just want to highlight a few key points in that um, you, can, you can promote pre pretty much most of the arguments in the 4K system to the quasi-periodic system uh, to, to talk about emergent symmetries in the effective Hamiltonian. So previously, we, we said that if we drive it in this special form, um, the one period unitary map, the Fouquet unitary, uh, is such that the time independent Hamiltonian has you know, an emergent ZN symmetry, where if, if gamma is in integer eigenvalue space with this particular driving amplitude, of course, not fine tuned, then you can write the, the unitary evolution operator in this form. But with the notion of having extra frequency components, we can not only couple it to one you know, gamma, one, one, one operator that has in, integer eigenvalue spacings, but we can couple it to many, many of them in, in different fashions. So gamma i, omega i, and i. And that basically means that um, you can, or, or we, we derive that you can derive an effective Hamiltonian, H effective, in which this guy, now not only having only a single Zn symmetry, has multiple Zn symmetries uh, where n1 to nm de uh, depends on the choice of, of, of integers here. And let me stress again that this is non-fine-tuned. Um, there's a envelope, a macro motion here, which is the generalization of the operator x here, which, uh, which raised the power of n is, is the identity and therefore is a generator. But here I've written it in continuous time. So at different times, I would realize uh, different combinations of the generators. And, and that is precisely what will give rise to the non-trivial micro-motion of the state uh, on top of the state that is evolving under the effective Hamiltonian. So upshot is that you can have multiple symmetries uh, due to the quasi periodic nature of the drive without any uh, fine-tuned input that the original driving Hamiltonian was symmetric to begin with. It only arises as long as you protect the quasi-periodic nature of the drive. And, and this is a key point I want to stress that this is very similar to the notion of equilibrium phases where uh, you know, for the icing phase, you need to protect the notion of Z2 in order for you to well-defined de notion of paramagnet versus ferromagnetic phase. If you break it in, in, in some Z2 uh, fashion, if you break it explicitly, you will never get uh, two phases. You will find that they are smoothly connected. So in this uh, similar fashion, I'm arguing that the only requirement is the periodicity of the drive or the quasi-periodicity of drive, not anything else. And, and that is what, what is emergent and what will protect the phases. So um, yeah, in a very similar fashion, so um, let me just sketch once again the, the idea of a discrete time quasi-crystal phase. And it's very similar to the Fouquet case. Uh, now, H effective has multiple symmetries and let me, consider the example where I'm driving it with two different frequencies and therefore I realize a Z2 cos Z2 symmetry. So having two frequencies doesn't necessarily just imply Z2 cos Z2. You can have, have more exotic ones, but let me assume that that's the case that it has Z2 cos Z2. And let's assume that each effective spontaneously breaks the symmetry so that it has four different wells, just like in the Fouquet case, uh, just like in the Ising case. And if I begin with one uh, state, initial state that is mainly in one well, then it will stay there for a long, long time under evolution by just if H effective. But the micro motion allows me to tunnel between the different barriers, uh, the, the, the different wells. Um, and importantly, this tunneling rate is, it doesn't retain the same periodicity as my original driving Hamiltonian. Because you see that um, if I evaluate the time, which is very close to an integer multiple of T1, and T2, where T1 and T2 are the periods of the two uh, independent drives, then the Hamiltonian comes back to itself. But this micro motion doesn't come back to itself uh, at those times necessarily. Um, at all times T1 and even times T2, it realizes X1. At a different combination, it realizes X2. And, and then at a different, even different combination, it realizes X1, X2. So it tunnels you to different parts of the, of the phase space at different rates. And it's only when you satisfy some conditions that it comes back to itself. So the upshot is that the state will um, respond with a very different quasi-periodicity than the original driving Hamiltonian. And, and this is illustrated, I guess, uh, here by here. So we can just focus on this two panels for now. Imagine that I'm driving the system with this profile, 
So I, I, I don't really specify what it is, but I'm, all I'm saying is that pictorially, you can imagine that I'm just driving hematillin with this profile. And uh, you can imagine that it, is, it derives from a higher dimensional hematonian with a periodicity, as you can see that if I translate by 2 pi in this way, and 2 pi in this way, it is periodic. But the response, um, just like in a period slide, could be very different, in which the unit cell of periodicity is much larger, and in fact, uh, different from the original unit cell of the driving hematonian. And, and this, this is a sub lattice of this higher order, uh, this underlying space. And therefore, we can say that this is a symmetry broken version of this guy. So in time, it's very analogous to the Fouquet statement that if we input it in frequencies of n dot omega, then the output frequency is no longer n dot omega, but alpha dot omega, where alpha are the reciprocal lattice vectors of this uh, higher dimensional space with a different unit cell than the original space it began with. And you can, of course, diagnose this in the power spectrum by looking at the peaks. Uh, and you notice that they were, uh, the peaks of the input drive uh, will be quite different from the peaks of the output drive. Uh, one might say that, one might, might uh, raise a contention that, well, actually the frequency components are dense, so you fill out the entire real line. But the point is that they are dense, but they'll be highly structured and peaked at certain values only. And you'll be able to resolve them uh, quite clearly whether one has the symmetry breaking pattern or not. And, and this is a completely analogous to the diffraction pattern that you would, one would see in a, in a quasi-crystal in space. You know, so you know, the quasi-crystals are projections for higher dimensional spaces and you would also see such dense spectra, but you can nevertheless observe the higher dimensional structure. And this is what we con uh, consider as a spontaneous breaking of multiple discrete time transition symmetries in a quasi-periodic system. So, um, I think I'm at the one hour mark, but I only have like two more slides or three more slides left to go. So I'll very quickly just run through them, but uh, maybe I should pause right now to take any questions or should I wait till later? Okay, I'll just wait for a few seconds to see if there are any questions from anyone. Maybe it's better if you finish and then we see. Yeah, okay. So it's not just uh, symmetry breaking phases that one can achieve in this uh, manner. So one could also realize new phases which are topological in nature. So we have this theorem which says that there's some effective um, Hamiltonian evolution, D. And we can consider the case when D is many body localized. So what that means is that the entire spectrum looks, you know, uh, colloquially like area law ground states. And therefore, we can fully we, we can we can ask um, together with this micro motion, uh, the eigenstates of D basically undergo quasi periodic motion around some torus, and it looks like a ground state. So we can ask, is what classification is there? Is is a map from the torus T M to the space of gap ground states, and therefore um, the classification in one uh, one driving dimension, one which is Fouquet has been given by Dominic Els and Chetan Nayak. And if you have a symmetry, internal symmetry G uh, together with the, um, yeah, yeah, so uh, of, of this setup, so TM is actually S1 now uh, to the space of ground states, then this is in one-to-one -one correspondence with the classification of equilibrium phases with symmetry G cross Z, where Z is the manifestation of the time transition symmetry of the group. Like basically it's saying whether or not you can contract the space of this um, the motion of the states uh, to a point or not, in this case for one dimensional, uh, for a for K system, M equals to one system. And in a very similar fashion, if now you have a quasi periodic system M, where M is the space of the torus, you can classify, uh, we, we can, you can make the conjecture and give arguments that the classification of such maps is the same as the classification of equilibrium phases with symmetry uh, ZM cross G, if G is the internal symmetry that that the system had to begin with. And, and this basically means that there are this whole host of new phases that can possibly emerge uh, in the quasi perfectly driven system that have no analogs in time independent or even for case systems. And it's an open question as to how one would write down microscopic models that realize the different classes in, in the different uh, classification schemes. So that's pretty much uh, what I wanted to, to, to mention to you. I hope I've mentioned to you how quasi particularly driven systems have a notion of multiple time translation symmetries, which in a very similar respect to time, uh, to equilibrium phases, protect the symmetries. And they are very non, uh, 
uh, fine-tuned and very robust, very stable notion of it because you can perturb around the limit and you nevertheless still see the phase of, of matter. And of course, what's really required is all, in addition to having the structure in time is a statement about the slow heating and such systems. So some outlooks and some uh, things that we've been working on to, to further our investigations is to look at it numerically and we have developed new methods of simulating such driven systems at high frequencies. Uh, Trotterization is very hard to do there, so we, we had to, to develop a new method for this. And uh, one also would like to construct explicit examples of quasi periodic topological phases. Um, there's a recent work actually that appeared last week from Andrew Potter's group. And so uh, they, they utilize you know, some of the concepts here and this is quite interesting works. Um, so I would also like to relax some of the, of the technical assumptions that we've made you know, in terms of like um, short rangeness of the system, inclusion of long range interactions and maybe openness of the system you know, instead of have, just having it being closed systems. And I think what's really more interesting is the fact that what this tells us is a story that if you have a certain structure in time of your driving uh, function, you know, so that would impose certain emergent symmetries onto the dynamics of the system, a certain uh, emergent yeah, symmetries of, of, on the system. So perhaps there's a different way of driving the system, which uh, you know, has a different structure in time, and that will give rise to a different uh, emergent symmetries, and therefore you can, you can define other novel phases of matter in, in such respects. And I think this, this is a nascent field and this is really open to investigation and I'm sure that there many, there, there'll be many exciting uh, new discoveries to be made in time. Okay, so thank you so much for your time and yeah, I, I would be happy to take questions if there are any questions. Great, thanks Manway. Any questions? So what do you think, uh, what is this new approach based on for numerics, you said? Well, it's um, the observation that actually a driven system can be understood as a time independent evolution, you know, in the extended space. And that allows one to then utilize all the time independent methods of simulating systems like Krylon. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, one could naively approach it by taking a drive and trotterizing it very, very finely and then just piecing together all the, all the unitaries, but you incur all the trotterization errors. But in this new way of formulating it, then what you're incurring is really the uh, Krylov errors only without any trotterization errors. So that's, you know, uh, it's, it's a trade-off. Of course, both methods would converge, but, but it's a matter of like, uh, in practice, which one's better. And if you go back some slides, you had some actual plot where you were explaining the time scale and uh, oh uh, yes, it's like this, some actual result of something. So what what is this? Uh, yeah, so no, no, this is really just a cartoon of uh, oh, so this is not a real result, okay? Uh, well, no, it's a real result in terms of uh, theory, but the cartoon is just a sketch of what it, it means. Okay, so the the blue curve is uh, just something random. The blue curve is some quasi periodic envelope that we added on top of the observable just to illustrate okay. this, this micro motion P. I see. Yeah, so it looks very nice. I agree with you. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, maybe I'll ask one more. So do you think that you could have emergent intrinsic topological order via some driving that doesn't rely on any symmetry? Um, so you're saying that in this classification, if, you, if I simply do away with the internal symmetry G? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess this recent work by uh, Andrew Potter and, and company um, so it doesn't quite fall into this classification because they are still working at a higher frequency limit if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. But the, the point I want to make is that um, if you're happy working at a higher frequency limit, then this Z2, like you can realize for example, Z2 cos Z2 symmetry without any intrinsic symmetry to begin with. So you mm -hmm. could define a 1D you know, phase of matter in which you're quasi-perfectly driving without any internal symmetry to begin with. 
and the boundaries might behave quasi periodically in, in a very analogous fashion to a Fouquet SBT scenario. So you, you don't have to protect any microscopic symmetry to begin with. So it's intrinsic in that manner, but it's tied to some limit of dynamics. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Yes. So maybe, maybe you mentioned this and I missed it, but in the quasi periodic case, mm -hmm. you were choosing the freak and then you were using the usual in uh, you know, quasi crystal construct of, of this lifting space. Mm -hmm. Yes. So what happens if, I, if rather than the quasi crystal drive, I have something that's like an approximant and I get closer and closer to the rational point. Mm -hmm. So what I would get out, because if I understood you say you drive quasi periodically, and you get this symmetry breaking into some quasi quasi crisp quasi time quasi crystal in time. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So if I drive with an approximant, I get larger and larger, you know, in the in the spatial case, mm -hmm. I would get larger and larger unit cells, right? That's right. So the same I mean is is it just the same thing? I drive uh, with an approximant, and then I get a symmetry broken time state, mm -hmm. which is also an approximant of another quasi crystal. So I, I would say that um, I guess, yeah, so you, you can analyze quasi periodically driven systems just by taking a family of uh, rational approximations of Fouquet systems. But then there's a question of like to what time scale, scale should you treat it? Like, because of course, a rational approximation defines a time scale before the motion stops becoming uh, stops becoming accurate because you know you you can't resolve the rational versus the quasi periodic nature of it up to some time scale. Mm -hmm. But then, but then you you need to uh, take the limit you know uh, of 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 this rational approximations at different times. Um, so you might be able to say that at short times, shorter times, there's this breaking into something more like a periodic. Uh, time crystal with a larger periodicity, but eventually this would break down, I guess, uh, and then you would have to really understand it from the truly incommensurate limit. So that was built in in the theorems that you were showing us about this sum of omega i over n i, etc. Was it an assumption of of incommensurability of those omega i's? Yeah. So right from the beginning, we assumed that the um, frequencies were, were rationally independent to begin with, so mm -hmm. that we could work completely in a torus picture. Yeah. Uh, I mean, one, one could, of course, analyze it, uh, as, as you say, in a family of uh, rational approximations, but we found that this was actually easier, more compact, to just simply work immediately in the, in the higher dimension of space. Okay, thanks. Do we have any other questions? Achilles? Uh, no, I, I think it's not no, no more question. All right, well then uh, let's stop it here. Uh, Wenwei, thanks again. Um, Th thank you. And yeah, thank, thank you. Audience. Thank you. Um, see you next week. Okay. Thank you so much for having me. See you. Thank you.